I have nothing good to say about Alan Sharp. And first of all, I never met him. Um, Alan Sharp was part was part of the PK, which is post Katie, post Katie career of Sam's, uh, because I, I was not on Osterman weekend. I, I, after Sam, after Convoy, I never spoke to Sam again, unfortunately. And one of my greatest regrets was at at his funeral was um, that I was unable to, you know, to close to close that part of my life with him. Um, but I was not on Osterman weekend. I think what Sa Alan Sharp was saying in the original Man of Iron, I I thought was unconscionable. I think he'd had no understanding of Sam's, of Sam, and I don't know why. Um, I, I, what he said in 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 the original Man of Iron about you know the violence crawling out of. Uh, but I have nothing to say about Alan Sharp. But, but I, yeah, his 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 view of Sam's. It, um, view of violence is, is so wrong uh, that um, I have nothing good to say about him. Alan, can you tell us a little of, of your a reaction as a member of an audience living in England to Sam's films? Well, uh, I, I, I suppose when The Wild Bunch uh, came out, uh, I, I remember w waiting to get at it, you know, knowing it was coming. I think it came down to Leicester Square or something like that. And I remember that kind of rushing down to get in kind of thing, which is not something you do all that much after you're a kid. So he, he was a real buzz, uh, certainly, where I was at. I mean, I was working in, in films, if you like, or television, and I was interested in westerns, and Peckinpah was the, the latest guy to come along who was still investing the genre with more information and expanding it. So The Wild Bunch was a big event. I think, as I recall, It and the Hustler were the two biggest events, film events, that I can you know remember in the the 60s, the late 50s, early 60s, and uh, it was a big deal. It was a real big deal, Sam was. Sam Peckinpah was. Uh, I'd seen Ride the High Country and I'd seen Deadly Companions. I had never seen any of his television stuff, but the word was coming out there was somebody there who was picking up the Ford mantle and carrying the Western forward, and when you saw it, you realised this wasn't John Ford's country, this wasn't John Ford's Western, this was a more psychotic kind of place, you know. I mean, it, it was beautiful and it was elegiac, but it had something else in it, which I didn't recognize at the time was uh, raging paranoia, but it, it was uh, it was new stuff. That kind of violence, you weren't seeing it a lot anyway, but if you were seeing it, you were seeing it more in urban contemporary pieces. The Western hadn't responded. I mean, we were all still shocked from uh, Jack Palance killing Elisha Cook Jr. and Shane, that was one of the most shocking things we'd ever seen in the Western, and Sam came along and said, you ain't seen nothing, man. And you, you, you hadn't seen anything. You uh, wrote Westerns yourself? And then subsequently, you came... subsequently, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that and the fact that you were working with Aldrich and with Fonda and other people? Well, I mean, this was all when I... I mean, this was prior... Sam Peckinpah's films were prior to anything I had written uh, being made. But I was interested in writing westerns, I think essentially because they were the most accessible kind of allegories. Uh, I mean, if you're from Scotland and you're living in London, writing westerns is a kind of a cul-de-sac type occupation. It's not, it's not going a lot of place in your own demesne, but uh, it, was, uh, it was what we had instead of samurai movies. You know what I mean? Where they were more accessible, and so I was—I had already written a script, uh, a western script, just for myself, and uh, it was just a, that Peck and Pie encouraged you to to believe what you'd always believed that the genre was capable of going on being expanded. It, there was nothing it could not do. It could do psychological studies, it could do sociological studies, it could be historical. Not that he in particular was any of these things, but he had indicated that. Ford and Delmer Daves and Howard Hawks and Anthony Mann, who had not 
by any means exhausted what the Western was capable. That was really encouraging if you were going to write in this genre. It allowed you to think that you could put your own personal, regional, parochial experiences into this exotic form and send it off and maybe somebody would be interested. And indeed they, and indeed they were. Uh, my, my own interest in the Western lay along slightly different lines from... Uh, but I know in, in Hired Hand, the villains in Hired Hand are derived almost directly from L.Q. Jones and Strother Martin, that kind of bad-toothed, fetid breath, bestial kind of a person that he seemed to be really interested in. You know? um, you, with Aldrich, of course, you made a, a very violent Western, but a, a, a different kind. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I always thought that the violence in Bolzana's Raid was was a bit more justifiable than ultimately I came to perceive the violence in Sam Peckinpah's westerns. I mean, it derived from cultural historical events and was understated in as much as the horrors of the Apache campaigns were not in any way exploited. They were they were minimalized in a kind of a way. They were gruesome enough. But, yeah, and, and Aldrich, anyway, was... I mean, a lot of people come to the Western and make the occasional Western. They even might make a great with George Stevens made Shane. I mean, I don't know that he made any other Westerns. You know what I mean? But he came to the genre. It was like it's like a composer doing a piano concerto and a symphony. And a, uh, Some directors are, are, are specifically Western directors. Aldrich was not. I think he had made it Vera Cruz 20 years before or something like that. He was essentially a man of urban sensibilities. And in many ways... Uh, I, I, I think Ozana's Raid reflects that. I mean, I think the real Western core of Ozana's Raid, apart from the script, is, is Lancaster. Uh, Bob shot it as he would have shot one of his noir kind of urban films, uh, I thought. He, he didn't have a, a Western sensibility, in, in my, which Peckinpah did. He, he, I think it was his favourite uh, mise-en-scene or something. It was his favourite place. Talking about the violence... Um... Schrader says that the violence goes beyond audience gratification <coughs> into a different territory of artifice. What's your view about the violence ultimately in Sam's work? Well, in a, in a funny kind of way, The Wild Bunch was both the, the apogee and the end of my uh, romance with Sam Peckinpah as an auteur filmmaker. I thought the opening was absolutely breathtaking. You had never, we had never seen anything quite like that in its, in its stylization and its uh, choreography and its lyricism and its horror, all of that. And it seemed like a brilliant thing to start a film with a climax, <laughs> you know, start a film with the end. And then it was about this declension in which these people who had run out of historical time were going to be attenuated. And I was thoroughly and totally engrossed in the film all the way through. I remember the scene when the bridge fell with all the horses on it. I thought, oh, that's a bit artificial. We got all those guys on a bridge so we could blow it up. But never mind, let's get on with the story. But when we got to the end and there was that shootout, I, was, I, thought, well, it, I thought it was pornography is what I thought it was. It was like all these bullets ripping into people's bodies and I was in the, I was in the presence of... I, I thought it was indulgence is what I thought it was. I thought he did it really good at the front, so he's going to do it really good at the back. But I subsequently decided that it was... Uh, it was what I would call pathological <laughs> behaviour. It was something in the, the filmmaker, the artist, extruding through the fabric of the, the material. It was like something had come up you know, someone had come up out of the picture and said, look at me, and it was horrible. It was, the end's horrible. When I see it now, it's even more horrible because it now looks an awful lot more dated than it did then. At least then you were being overwhelmed by the, the newness of the slow motion and the repetitive cutting and the... But it had all of the things that I don't like about Peck and Pan. I mean, the women that shoot the men in the back and the whores that have been, like, fucked in the wine vats and stuff like that that then murdered... I mean, it was... It was it was ugly and it was and I and the assumption was oh well this was what it was really like but it wasn't really like that at all it wasn't really like that at all I mean gunfight at the OK Corral they apparently they fired thirty two shots between them both sides and I think six of them hit and they were standing five or six feet from one another you know what I mean it wasn't like that at all they were terribly bad marksmen 
and uh, it was a different. It was just it was uh, it was Sam Peckinpah. That wasn't the West, and that wasn't even. Well, I suppose it was that movie, but that, that was when he stood up and said, "This is what I am," and, and it was true because after that, that's what he did. My, my strongest association with Sam. If you say Sam Peckinpah to me, I see a bullet going into somebody's body. I mean, that's what I associate with Sam Peckinpah. Not the Western or lyricism or anything else. I see. <laughs> an advert for the National Rifle Association or something like that, you know. Um, the Jason Robards said about Noon Wine from the Catherine uh, mm. Water story that the central character came to terms with the violence within himself. Do you think that that is a, a, a running theme through Sam's work? Well, I don't. I I think that may be true. I did. I've never seen Noon Wine. I've never seen Sam Peckinpah's Noon Wine. Uh, I, but I don't think that the characters in the Sam Peckinpah films that I know could be said to represent people who were coming to terms with the violence within themselves. They were essentially people who were acting out the violence within themselves. And as I say, my experience, my personal experience of Sam Peckinpah came very, very late in his career indeed. But by the time I had worked here for a while, the stories that I'd been hearing about, you know, the artist crushed by the you know, the producers who didn't understand what he was doing and who insisted on in cutting the last 20 minutes out of his films and things like that, had been given, had been modified by meeting a few of these producers. And, I mean, I, I worked with a man called Bob Sherman who worked with uh, Sam on Convoy. And it wasn't as if Bob represented for me, you know, the apex of the producer's craft or anything like that, but I, I realised that this guy had, had had a very, very unpleasant experience, Bob Sherman. And it had a lot to do with the fact that he was working with Sam Peckinpah. And I don't think a director's job is to make a producer feel good, do you understand? I don't think that's his function. But I, I had come to modify the, the ancient sort of Eric von Stroheim idea that they've got nothing in their head but their heart or their mind but their heart to realise it's a, it's a cooperative, collaborative effort. And when one person so assumes the high ground that everybody else is looking up at them... Can we talk about Osman Weekend? Right. How did that happen, and at what point did Sam come on come on board? I had written a, a, a script uh, for the producers, Peter Davis and Bill Panzer, uh, from another script they had, which they were not satisfied with, and I, I, they brought me in to rewrite it, and I did. And uh, at the end of the day, we had kind of completely, you know, rewritten the script, and we had even abandoned the... The book, Ludlum's books are, I'd written one before, they're really weird, they're, I don't, you know, when you read them in the plane or something like that, they seem very densely textured and the plotting seems very sort of uh, intricate, but when you dissect them, you find that there's not nearly enough bones in them, they hold all the flesh up, kind of deal, you know, and in the mo a screenplay's got to throw out so much of the book to get at the structure, and you find that the plots don't really work as plots in screen terms, they, they don't actually hold together. So... We struggled with this, I thought, totally unsuccessfully, and we wrote what I considered to be... I wrote what I considered to be a pretty duff script, which was substantially different from the book, but it was duff nonetheless. And I sort of never thought I'd hear another word about this. I just didn't think this was a very viable kind of thing. So I took my money and went away. And uh, I think probably two years later, uh, my agent called me up and said, I didn't know you wrote The Austin awesome Weekend, because I'd never... I actually told them <laughs> I'd written it. But he, it was announced in the trades that it was going to be made with Sam Peckinpah. And I was... A number of things, one of which was astonished. I was embarrassed as well, but I was really surprised. So I went to see Davis Pines and they said, yeah, we've got, uh, we've got Sam Peckinpah. He's, as it were, coming out of retirement to do this, which... I mean, I knew he, he'd gone off the boil a bit. I didn't know very much about his personal life, but I knew he hadn't made a film for a while, and I was kind of surprised that this would be the film he would come out of retirement to make, but... There you were. Uh, and that, that was it. So it started off with me going, wow, he's going, Sam Peckinpah's going to do this. And it didn't seem to me to be his material. It wasn't a particular, you know, it wasn't a particularly violentish kind of thing. It didn't seem to have any of his heroes that I recognised. There was no recognisable... No, there was no recognisable Peckinpah and sort of personas in it that I could make out. Anyway, we, we we met because the, the script had to be you know improved uh, to be to be and that was the first time I'd met Sam Peckinpah, 
And of course, it was right at the end of his career. I think that's the last film he made. And the the thing that struck me most uh, pronouncedly was the guy was ill. This was an ill person. This was, I mean, unwell, physically unwell. He seemed really low energy. He seemed to be husbanding his resources. And we went through, Rutger Hauer was the, there was a very good cast, I mean, and, and a cast of excellent sort of actors. And we went through a fairly, well, several weeks certainly, of working on the script, trying to, and it's one of the, it was one of those scripts that when you fixed it here, it broke over there, you know what I mean? It just, it wasn't, it wasn't real, it wasn't a real story. You, you couldn't really do anything to it that made it other than an artifice. But the presumption was that Sam would superimpose this, his style on it. And I thought my task as a writer was to find out what he wanted in the way of superimposition. Well, you know, and we never had a, we didn't in any way have a quarrel, but uh, we, we didn't have a, a rapport. I never really understood what it was he wanted to do about this thing. Uh, I never understood his vision. Then I came to the conclusion that he was working to pay the bills, like the rest of us. Uh, and that was why he was doing this piece of dreck was my take on it. But uh, it was an interesting situation because the producers were really young and sort of this was their biggest movie to date. It was a big thing, much bigger budget than they had been on. And they were quite in awe of Sam, properly speaking. And this was the first time I had witnessed Sam Peckinpah working with producers. And my opinion was that he could have these guys eating out of his hand. All he had to really do was say, I ain't going to give you a real hard time like I have given many people, and it was home free. And in point of fact, he struck what seemed to me a totally unnecessarily confrontational kind of attitude with them that I, I, didn't, I didn't get it. I didn't get what we were getting out of this. I didn't see... You know, I, I, in fact, I said to him, I said, well, I don't know why you're... I don't know why you're born with these guys, I don't know, and your league, I mean, why are you, like, getting so steamed up about them? And, uh, yeah, well, he was polite enough not to tell me he made me own fucking business, you know, but he didn't tell me why he was getting steamed up. And on that thing, the most one of the most remarkable things I have ever witnessed in my time of working in the film business or writing or I came on, we'd have these script meetings, you know, the usual bullshit sessions where you sit around and everybody talks and says this, that and the other. And they would go on as they do for literally hours. Rutger Howard would be in them and Sam and the producers and me and that kind of stuff. And we'd all bandy back and forth and talk things through. And in the morning when you came in for the next one, all that had been said had been recorded and had been typed up in transcript. So there were these enormous transcripts of all this rubbish you had talked the day before, which represented an enormous amount of finger hours, so to speak, for one thing. And I thought, oh, well, you know, we didn't refer to them. We didn't. And I said to Davis Panzer, I've got, well, why, why, why are we doing it? Why is this happening? And it, apparently it was because Sam wanted to have a transcript record of what had been said so there could not subsequently be any reneging on, I, I just seemed weird to me. That seemed, I thought, oh, that, that, that to me was paranoid behaviour. It was strange, very strange. I'd never seen anything like that. Were there any other evidences of paranoid behaviour? Were you around the set, you know? No, uh, I wasn't. I was at rehearsals and uh, he was exceedingly, exceedingly laid back at rehearsals. I mean, there was... Burt Lancaster was in it, and Roger Howard and Craig T. Nelson, and uh, Dennis Hopper had a little part. Dennis Hopper was starting to swing back in again. Uh, the rehearsals were, uh, they seemed to me to be read-throughs, and there was certainly no indication of a, he wasn't a bully or anything like that, nor did I feel, nor did I get the sense that he was, unearthing or the material and like that. The, the rehearsal seemed kind of pro forma to me a little bit. Uh, and I know that the film was completed hmm, kind of on time and that the producers only tore some of their hair out and the film was, well, the film's what it is. It's just neither here nor there, you know. I mean, it's not a Sam Peckinpah movie and then a Robert Ludlum movie, whatever that might be. It's not, it's not a script that I think of with great kind of... Uh, I think he just came and worked, you know. 
I mean, that's what he did. He had to work, and he came and worked, and he, he was he did professional work, and he got the film finished. And I, I don't really have much to say about it. When I viewed it, I thought, oh, it's not as bad as I thought it might have been, but it's not, wasn't saying a lot, you know. Did you see him after that? Never saw him again. And I mean, I, I had no. We had a. He. He had his assistant, a, a lady, whose name. I, alas, I do not remember, uh, speak to me on terms that when you boil them down, Kate was a way of asking, whose side are you on, Sam's side or the producer's side? I mean, it was as clear as that. It wasn't... And I was a bit surprised uh, that, you know... That, and I'd said, well, you know, if it has to come to sides, I guess I'm on the producer's side because, I mean, if you, if you want to get into sides... Because I worked for them a lot, and I'll probably work for them again, and they hired me, and but I, I don't really, you know. Uh, but Sam didn't ask me himself. He didn't. I mean, he didn't put himself in that position. But it, it was all. Oh, it was slightly. And that was a bit sad. I thought I, I didn't know what to make of that, or I did know what to make of it, and it kind of saddened me a bit. I, I just felt that the lines were drawn so firmly between them and. I mean, Bob Aldrich used to say everybody on the other side of the camera is the enemy because he had this attitude about actors, which was partly a joke, but was partly not a joke. I think with Sam, everybody in the offices were the enemies, and he may very well have a good reason to believe that. I, I don't know. But I, I, I didn't associate with him thereafter. We didn't have a... We didn't really have a lot to say to one another in a kind of a way. No. His His... His preoccupation with with violence, to, to me, uh, began to oust the Western from uh, any real centrality. I mean, he, he, it was a, a place in which people, to me at the end, it was a place in which people could commit mayhem. It was an acceptable place for mayhem to be committed. Since almost all of Sam Peckinpah's films, as far as I can make it, about, had, a, had this mayhem content, uh, ultimately, I, I thought the Western was, when I say debased, would be a bit thing, but I, I didn't think that he was paying as much attention to the Western and its idiom uh, as I certainly would have liked. I thought there was more on the Western than met Sam Peckinpah's eye. But I think, on the other hand, he, he was not like Aldrich or Hawks or somebody who made a couple of Westerns. He made a lot of Westerns and he made them... And he expanded the... I mean, I think he did expand the, the, the genre, and a lot of other films are based on work that he did first. I mean, Ride the High Country, I think, is particularly seminal, as they say, probably more so even than The Wild Bunch, because you could copy Ride the High Country a lot easier than you could copy uh, The Wild Bunch. You know, it had much more of a sort of imprint on it. So, yeah, I, I think it was, but but I think, and I don't profess to know what Sam Peckinpah's demons were, but his attitude towards women as expressed in his films, I mean, I, I can't remember any, what I would call real relationships, uh, or I, I can remember very little affection between men and women. I can remember Stella Stevens bathing Jason Robards in uh, Cable Hogue in, in, in the tub, but there was something... I don't know that 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 wasn't to me relational either. It was um, it was kind of shtick of a, of a kind. I just got the sense that he uh, you you wouldn't look to Sam Peckinpah films to discover the nuances of the male female relationship. Uh, Is the Western suited to that anyway? Yeah, there's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't be. I mean, it tended women tended to get short shrift in them. But that was the point. The Western was just as capable of, of dealing with, you know, the relational mode as any other. The problem, if, is, if you were about the Western, it's, it's a melodramatic form in which action is supposed to resolve the consequences of the people's behaviour. And that puts a little bit of a, a premium on, you know, macho-type behaviour. But it, it's, it, it doesn't exclude it. There, there's plenty of room for... Uh, it, it, it's no more inhibitive of uh, relational things, I don't think, the Western, than the gangster movie or uh, anything else, no. What um, about his strengths and weaknesses as a director, would you say? I think he was like a natural-born film maker. He, 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 I, you got the sense that between 
his eye and what went on the screen, the fact that there was all of this shit around uh, was, uh, was not inhibiting. The, the, he, he, there was a great fluency to the way he put pictures on the screen. I mean, um, he, he, I, I thought he was as, as fluent a filmmaker, say, as David Lynch is. I mean, whatever you think of David Lynch is, well, you know this guy can make pictures. I mean, he just puts a the camera there and everything just kind of gathers around it and kind of worships the lens. Well, Sam was, was a wonderfully fluent filmmaker, I thought. And he, I think he was probably... An, an excellent editor, I would get the sense, because he generated a lot of energy inside uh, the film. And I don't just mean the big, extravagant kind of multi-camera, slow-mo kind of stuff. He was a he was a dynamic kind of editor and dynamic filmmaker. I think he had great great skills, wonderful skills as a filmmaker, really talented. And uh, I mean, one would have loved to see him make do comedy and one would love to, you know, I mean, th this talent presumably would apply anywhere. He was a very, very fluent filmmaker. And I, I got the sense of constriction with his work. It, his work closed down into what became more and more kind of parody, kind of self-parody. And I don't know him well enough to know, I mean, I've heard all the tales of wild and rampant behaviour and all that kind of stuff and guns on the set and things like that, And uh, but I, I don't know any of it personally. And I don't know anybody's personal life, so I'm, I'm not going to superimpose some psychoanalysis on his work. But if I was just to look at but <laughs> if I was just to look at his work, I think, oh, he's not terribly happy here, are we? <laughs> you know what I mean? It didn't look well. It didn't look like a happy world where Sam was, uh, you know. Was well. and, and, and I mean, when I met him first time, it, it was that. It was this. I don't know what Sam age Sam Peckinpah was when I met him. I guess he's late fifties, he's early sixties, and it was a little translucent elfin kind of a man, you know? And you wanted to, a bit of you wanted to say, you know, to be all right, Sam, don't worry. And these guys, you shouldn't be, uh, you know, don't don't bother with them, they're just boys. I mean, you, you, but, you know, he's a man in his life. He kind of come up to men in their life and, well, you can. <laughs> you can come up and say, hey, don't worry, but you feel a bit stupid uh, or you feel a bit presumptuous. And I must say, he, he was he was very kind to my presumptions. I, I said with what I thought was genuine affection, I wouldn't I wouldn't waste the time on these guys, you know. I mean, not that I'm putting them down, but they're not in your league, guy. You know, why are you... And he was polite enough not to tell me, as I said, I go, fuck myself. Uh, he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think by that time, it was Pavlovian, you know what I mean? The bell rang and... The saliva dripped and he went for the fucking throats. <laughs> like that. It was, it was funny. It's kind of sad. Pat Garrett looks like the final nail in the coffin of the Western. Have you got a thought about that? I remember uh, being enormously uh, impressed and really frustrated. I mean, uh, Billy the Kid is one of the, you know, one of the great uh, Contes, one of the, what are they called, Cante Hondos, one of the big songs of the Western uh, mythology. And his was a very uh, fresh and, and, and vigorous look at it. I did not know when I saw it that the film had been truncated so savagely as I had subsequently heard that, you know, 20 minutes had been taken off the end. When I found that out, I thought, oh, that's, that, that kind of explains the sense of never quite getting to where you were going. It seemed a very long, and when I say long, I don't just mean long in time, it seemed a very uh, undulating kind of a film, you know, with these set pieces of... <laughs> but it was good. But it was as if they had taken the last movement off, you know what I mean? So you didn't actually get to the end of the piece, but you'd taken an awful long time, but you still didn't get there. Uh, and uh, it, it kind of made s sense. Uh, I'm not enormously sympathetic to people who make very, very long films in the sense that, well, I mean, I've always thought Von Strohin was kidding himself when he made a nine-hour film and then complained that they cut it. You know what I mean? Give us a break, guy. I, I don't, I, I presume uh, Pat Garrett and Billy Kidd was probably about three hours, ten minutes intentionally, but even that is, you know, th there's almost a kind of a, I know you're asking to be, uh, you know, and and if you leave your film so extended at the end that they can cut twenty minutes out of it, you haven't been doing your own work 
if you're going to make a film three hours ten, you better make something happen at the end that they kind of cut out. I would have thought if you can lop it off like a sausage, then maybe there was something wrong with your narrative structure. But uh, I thought it was a very, very elegant and, and eloquent uh, film, which left me kind of uh, so what? Yeah, more did I miss it? Did I something like that? There was something, something not complete about it, and you could reasonably say, well, of course it wasn't because they cut it so badly. I, I don't know. If he was back here now, for a moment. What would you say? Ease up. Ease up. I mean, you know, it's only fucking movies after all. I mean, don't take it as a bloody serious. Have a bit more... Do your some, do something that you're not good at. Do something that you're now... that you don't know how to do. Take a, take a chance. Go off and do something else and... I don't know, get off this... Them guys are fucking me over trip. I mean, they probably are, but get off it. I mean, just... Uh, I mean, what skills to have? What 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 gifts to have? And I mean, there's nothing. There can't be many. I've not done it. I've done it only but once. But there's nothing much more exciting and pleasant than being a film director. I mean, it is a buzz, man. And uh, I don't know. I, can't, I don't know. Could have had. I don't know. <laughs> Just do other things and 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 let your let your. Let your gifts reward you or something like that. I didn't, I, I felt he had a, a, a hard deal. And I mean, he was giving himself a hard time. I, I, that's what I felt. I just felt all the time. Relax. But he was ill. He was, he was, he was unwell. I mean, he died shortly thereafter to prove it, you know? So he wasn't, he wasn't a well fella.